What are the four keys to success when it comes to attracting a partner who you believe could be a truly great fit for your life? Let's hit it. What's up everybody? Thank you so much for joining me today. My name is Dr. Phoenix Singh and it is a pleasure to be here with you. Uh, my goal for today is to be able to discuss with you uh, what the literature has led me to believe are really the four keys when it comes to uh, attracting someone who you believe could be a good fit for you and your life. Now, if you watch other videos on this channel, you'll know that I personally do not believe in the concept of a soulmate. Uh, in terms of the Christian faith, I actually believe that it's antithetical uh, to our conceptualization of God. Uh, the idea that we would only have one individual and that there's nobody else out there who could be a good fit for us or that there's a perfect individual. And I believe that, that this cultural phenomenon of a belief in a soulmate uh, ironically has made attraction and dating within the church, uh, it's made it a lot more difficult and it's become a very high pressure situation that, uh, that I wish we could avoid, but now you know we have to deal with it because it's just kind of part of the culture. Um, so keeping in mind just that mindset that I have, okay, that framework that I have, that there is no such thing as, you know, only one soulmate, that's all you've got, uh, then it becomes a much more uh, equitable situation in terms of there's a lot more that we can do to be able to meet an individual rather than the individual, right? Uh, an individual who would challenge us in our faith, who would push us to be the best version of ourselves. You know, how are we going to meet a person like that? Well, at the end of the day, uh, I have found that there's really four keys, and that's what I want to share with you today. So the first key is opportunity. Now, what do I mean by this? Well, when it comes to meeting someone, obviously, you need to maximize the chances uh, that you're going to meet them by meeting as many different people as you can. Now, in this day and age, you would think that with technology, it would be so much easier to be able to meet people. But ironically, access to all of this technology and how common it is to use this technology uh, for socializing purposes have made, has made it so that we're way worse in terms of in-person social skills, in-person interaction. Even though we're way better at things like, you know, texting, uh, it's just the use of all these different, you know, swipe-based apps or, you know, online dating apps, something like a Christian Mingle, an eHarmony, and Match.com, you guys get the idea. Uh, it is so instant in terms of our gratification and it allows us to essentially hide behind a screen. The way that I refer to these things is like Splenda, right? Like an artificial sugar. Because something like Splenda, it looks like sugar and it tastes like sugar. But that ain't sugar. It's the same thing when it comes to socialization. Things like social media, dating apps, etc. It feels like socialization or flirting, uh, right? So it, it looks like it, it feels like it, but it's not the same. Uh, there are so many elements of uh, the initial approach, initial conversations, even the first date, that are so anxiety provoking that instead of people leaning into the anxiety, we essentially spend the preponderance of our time, especially if we're using these technological means of communication, to essentially just chat with one another. Uh, if you look at the stats on it, what you'll find is that almost 70% of individuals who are on dating apps uh, and dating websites never go on one date. Never even go on one date, like that's so surprising. But a lot of people are using it as an outlet, right? Because remember, things like survival and replication, these are, you know, implicit uh, biological drives that we have. And so because of that, people are always deeply seeking connection. And we are so overstressed and overworked, especially, you know, I live in the United States and the US uh, and in big cities. So like I'm in the DC area, right? I mean, I see it every day, the amount of stress, the amount of overwork. Uh, it's just really overwhelming even to see my friends go through it. You know, I've obviously been through it. Uh, and so because of that, we feel like we don't have enough time almost to slow down enough even to enjoy in-person interactions. So we use proxies, we use Splenda, right? And in this case, the proxy is this online dating and these things. But it really prevents us from having those very unique biological reactions to actually meeting someone in person. Uh, it is literally, uh, there is a chemistry to 
chemistry. And we'll talk about that in other videos, but you can only really experience that when you're face to face with someone. And especially these days where our social skills honestly are on the decline. And we see that even in neurological studies where the parts of our brain that are associated with social skills and also with verbal communication are actually weakening in the brain uh, because we, we're simply not using them as much, right? We're not relying on them relative to things like texting. You know, we don't have to pick up the phone. I can't tell you the number of people I've talked to where they're like, whoa, 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 you want me to call? Call her? You want me to pick up the phone when he calls? What are you talking about, right? That can be really intimidating. Uh, but it is so important to be able to go out and essentially see in person uh, who kind of jives with you, right? Uh, there can be people on dating apps, etc., where you look at the photos and you're just like, ah, not for me. You see that person in real life, you see how they interact, you see their nonverbals, you see the warmth of their voice, whatever it happens to be, and you say, you know, that person isn't, you know, really quote unquote my type, whatever you would define that as, but wow, that's a really attractive person. And when that happens, it's something very, very special, and we'll talk about in other videos why it is that that happens and what different characteristics are in terms of nonverbals and other things that only can be experienced really in person uh, that, that really maximize people's attractiveness. But again, we'll only be able to experience if we give ourselves those opportunities. It doesn't mean that just because we're, you know, going to, let's say, three small groups, that's a lot of small groups, three small groups, we're on meetup.com, or we are on, let's say, a couple of these, you know, dating apps or dating websites, that we're going to meet someone. It doesn't mean that. But what it means is that we're maximizing the likelihood that that's going to happen, okay? Nothing's gonna happen if we stay kind of, you know, locked in our house and we're waiting for somebody to come knock on our door who we've never met before to be able to say, hey, I'd love to take you on a date. That would be nice, but it's not gonna happen, right? It is scary to put yourself out there because we're risking rejection. Uh, and essentially what rejection is, is it's a feeling of, oh my gosh, like literally nature is rejecting me. Biology is rejecting me. Someone is literally looking at me into my soul, you know, who I am, at least at face value, and rejecting who I am to say, I don't want to be able to co-mingle my Sorry, genes with your I'm genes. Okay, apparently Alexa's having trouble hearing me. Or Siri. Sorry, Amazon. I'll put my phone over here, or my watch over here. You know, so it ends up being one of these cases where to be able to go out there is terrifying, but also absolutely necessary. And ironically, look at archetypal stories, right? The dragon guards the gold. The thing that is terrifying ironically holds the treasure. It's guarding the treasure. And if you can go and vanquish the dragon, then what you're going to end up finding is that that sense that, not, you know, somebody didn't settle for you. You went out and you worked for it. Wow, what, what a tremendous amount of self-esteem that creates. And obviously you want a solid level of self-esteem before you even start a relationship, but it's something that's just going to even further incrementally boost that. So seek out opportunities to meet people and don't forget that just because you may go to a place, let's say uh, you go to a, a new small group or a new church or you go to a new meetup or it's somebody's birthday party, whatever it is, uh, and you go there and you just say, well, there's nobody really here who's you know my type physically or there's nobody here really with the same personality type, whatever it is. Or maybe everybody that is at a given event, they're all in a relationship or they're all married and have kids, whatever it is, right? Never forget that every person knows at least 10 people, okay? Uh, and I guarantee you, you know, whenever I go out or whatever for my matchmaking company and uh, I meet somebody who's in a relationship, I always say, I'm not gonna give you my card, I'm gonna give you two cards. And I always say the reason is, is that everybody in a relationship knows two single people who they can't wait to get into a relationship, right? So I'm gonna give you two cards instead of one. Never forget that people who you enjoy, let's say, that are already in a relationship, right? That they're friends, you're significantly more likely to also be attracted to their friends because you're attracted to them. Think about it like in math class, seventh grade, Mr. Ogilvy. okay? Shout out to Mr. Ogilvy. he was the man. Uh, so what happened in Ogilvy's class was that we learned about the commutative property. This idea that if A is equal to B and B is equal to C, then A is equal to C, okay? So in this case, that friend is B, okay? 
So they're friendly enough and they're, they like you. They think you're a great guy or a great gal, right? And you like them as well. Well, the thing is they know somebody else that they also know and like. So the odds are that you guys are more likely to be able to get along and possibly in a way that is romantic in nature. It's fantastic. You do have to chase down this rabbit hole. In my first company that I sold back in 2017, it was a startup, so I basically had to do everything, right? It's the great thing about startups. And what I learned in terms of sales and marketing is that your sales cycle was pretty long. You just had to keep going down that rabbit hole. And that's the case when it comes to dating, and it can be exhausting. It can be exhausting meeting more and more people. But I know for a fact that unless you try intentionally to identify those opportunities, and even on those days where you don't feel like it, you don't feel like putting on that outfit, you don't feel like you know looking your best if you're a guy, like look at me in terms of the bald head, right? I look better when I freshly shave my head, when I freshly do my beard, etc. Uh, ladies, it may be something for you where it's makeup or you know choosing the right accessories, whatever it happens to be. You don't feel like doing it all the time. And I respect, acknowledge, and understand that. Uh, it's something where we need to lean into that anxiety, push ourselves, uh, and you can trust me that really amazing things can happen when you do that. So that's number one, right? Seeking out and then taking advantage of opportunities. Key number two is what I refer to as optimization. Uh, and of the four that I'm gonna share with you today, this is one that's very near and dear to my heart, and it's something that I have spent many, many years uh, analyzing, trying to get to the root to. Uh, and what I've identified is seven different dimensions that every human being has, that if we really wanna be a self-actualized person, the best version of ourselves, uh, that we need to explore. And keep in mind that this is an asymptotal thing, right? Meaning that if this is the goal, we're never gonna get there, right? Okay, so the goal is basically the journey to get as close as we can. The closer we get, it'll always elude us. That's life, right? But we always have to be seeking, right? We always have to be moving. We're like sharks, right? If we don't move forward, we die. That's it, okay? So in terms of these seven dimensions, and I'll make a whole video doing a really deep dive into this, right? But the seven areas of your life that I want you to think about how you could be the best versions of yourself, okay? Uh, is your physical health, your mental health, your spiritual health, your educational or uh, occupational health, so things like your financials. Uh, five, six, and seven are all social. One is your social uh, life when it comes to romance. One is your social life in terms of platonic relationships, so like friends. And the final one is your social life when it comes to your family, both your nuclear family as well as your extended family. These are the seven different areas, and what I recommend is every six months sitting down, just totally by yourself, nobody else ever needs to see this, make a list of those seven different dimensions and give yourself a rating, like a percentage out of 100%, right? How are you doing in these different areas? And then, regardless of whether you're at 1% or whether you're at 99%, we always have ways to improve. What are three action items, really practical things, right? Not like, oh, I'm gonna go out and I'm gonna meet the person of my dreams. That, that's not an action item, right? It could be, I'm gonna go out to a new event one time per week right? Or maybe uh, when it comes to church, I'm going to go to church once a month. You haven't been going, I'm going to go once a month. Doing things in these bite-sized chunks makes it a lot more likely that you're going to be able to stick to this. And that's really what I want for you, is I want your goals to be sticky in nature, okay? So those are the seven different dimensions of optimization. Uh, and I can tell you that the time to optimize, a lot of people put this off. They say, well, you know, I'm going to, it's almost like I'm going to get to that once I'm in a relationship, once I'm married, once I, I have that partner, uh, but that is uh, this God-shaped uh, handprint on your heart that only he can fill, okay? It, it's not something where, uh, you know, we need someone else to be able to, to fill that for us. Uh, and it is very dangerous to say, I'm gonna wait until I'm in a relationship, or especially I'm gonna wait until marriage, to explore these areas of myself, figure out who I am, what I want, and the boundaries that I have that I will not stand to be crossed in the context of a romantic relationship. It is essential to be able to get these things in line to explore yourself while you're single. Uh, I can't tell you the number of couples that I've uh, worked with, that I've spoken to on, on many 
many, many occasions that share with me this sense of codependency that they have inadvertently developed over the years because they did not optimize themselves when they were single. And it leads to tremendous feelings of contempt and resentment. And as we'll talk about in other videos, contempt is one of the four horsemen, uh, as Gottman calls it, which essentially means one of the four biggest predictors of divorce. So we really want to make sure that we do everything possible while we're single to be able to optimize ourselves such that we have a solid foundation when we do meet someone that we're interested in exploring a romantic relationship with. This leads to key number three, which is the prioritization of faith. Like I mentioned, right, all of us, every human being, we could be married for 100 years, we could uh, have be single until we're 80 years old. Uh, it doesn't matter, right? All of us have this heart print, as some people call it. Uh, in other words, kind of a God-shaped handprint, right, on our hearts that can only be filled by God. Uh, all of us, you know, I was an atheist for the longest time. We try to use everything else to be able to fill it. Some people use drugs and alcohol. Some people use romantic relationships and sex. Uh, we use all sorts of things, right? Overwork and isolation, whatever it is, we try to fill that. But no matter what we do, it is a never-ending hole. It is literally like you're in a boat that has a big hole in the bottom of it. Every time you're bailing water out, more water's coming in at the same time. It is impossible to be able to properly anchor and steal yourself uh, without exploring your relationship with God. When I look at the cross, I think about, you know, sizing. I think about the length of the cross this way versus this way. And I want you to think about it as this being God and this being you and this being everybody else. You will never be able to have a truly strong relationship with other people until you first get right with God in terms of knowing who he is, what he really wants and believes and is driving for in your life, and just how much he loves you exactly how you are. He doesn't need you to have a partner. He is going to and is already blessing you in so many ways that you may not even realize. Sometimes if we don't see something happening in front of us, we just think it's not happening, right? Or that, you know, well, you know, God's either doing something or he's not. But uh, sometimes you can think about God like a television producer, right? So uh, I'm on the news oftentimes on uh, various channels uh, giving advice. And, you know, there's all these TV producers who are never on camera. They're in the back, but they make everything work and they're doing stuff whether you know it or not. They're coordinating everything. And that's exactly what God is like, right? But the thing is, is that if we don't ground ourselves in faith and ground ourselves in God, uh, we will never be able to have a non-codependent relationship, or non-dependent at least, relationship with a romantic partner. And the reason is, is that our partner will always let us down. Uh, there is a fallacy in the belief of unconditional love. Uh, this is, you know, for example, there's that movie Love Story, uh, American movie, and there's a phrase in it, which is a famous phrase now in pop culture, which is, love means never having to say you're sorry. Um, I could, that's not true. Please, please say sorry, especially when you, don't say sorry unless you really mean it, okay? Uh, otherwise, it's really disingenuous. Uh, but sorry, it's very important to learn how to say and not be ashamed to say in the context of a relationship, okay? Um, and that doesn't, it doesn't matter if you're married 30 years or you've been seeing the person on your third date, okay? It's really important to, to own up to mistakes and misunderstandings, all right? And to be able to use that term uh, in a way that's very genuine. Uh, but by prioritizing your faith and getting to know God well, you will learn that he is the only thing that is able to provide you with truly unconditional love. And unconditional love is terrifying because we as human beings do not deserve it. Uh, at all. We do not deserve it. And it doesn't matter how religious you are. Uh, if you go to church uh, seven days a week, whatever it is, you're going to make so many mistakes in your life and so many sins where we're defining sins as missing the target that God has set for us. Not some, you know, evil, evil thing or any of this kind of stuff, right? It is just missing the mark that God has set for us. And it's ironic because what God has set for us is he, is, he is desires for us to be happy. He has set out these guidelines for us, biblically, through scripture, to be able to get us to be happy. Uh, it's not a fence to be able to you know, keep us in. It's to be able to keep uh, things that would make us unhappy out. And this is something that when I was an atheist, I never truly understood until I started to explore faith more deeply. 
And at the end of the day, by prioritizing faith and having that strong anchor in God's love, we are able to open our heart in a way that has a strong boundary for other people, such that we become bike reflectors of God's love. By exploring a closer relationship and by tapping into the vine, which is God's love. Uh, and if you're a Christian, right, it would be through Jesus Christ. What would happen is that you have you and you have a future partner, right? And you've got God. Ironically, by getting closer to God in terms of both of you doing that, you are getting closer to one another, right? So a fulfilling spiritual life, I would argue, is very critical to a stable relationship. And it makes relationships significantly more fulfilling if you can share that with a partner. So that is number three in terms of my keys, is prioritizing your faith to the point where you understand that you do not need a partner. And not only is there nothing wrong with being single, being single, I mean, Paul tells us, right, uh, in one of his letters, uh, it is the only time in your life that you're going to be able to prioritize, like truly prioritize God and your relationship with God. Because once you get into a romantic relationship, once you get into that kind of a, of a partnership, you're going to find that you have so many more responsibilities uh, and so many more, you know, human, like flesh responsibilities with that other individual. And so because of that, uh, it ironically takes you a bit further away from God and that's tough but of course God blesses it uh, and God blesses you being single it's such a beautiful thing people get so down on themselves for being single it's one of the best times of your entire life and not because you can you know I'm gonna go out and do whatever I want and have indiscriminate sex and these sorts of things that's not why right the reason why it's so special is that it gives you the opportunity to optimize, to get to know as many people as possible through exploring opportunities, uh, through your prioritization of faith, and also through the fourth key, which we'll discuss now. And finally, the fourth key is, uh, once you've learned to really be who you are, it is so difficult to do this fourth key, but it is one of the most fulfilling things that you will explore and master in your life, which is what I call authentic presentation. When you meet someone for the first time, or as they kind of get to know you, let's say you're a little bit shy, there's nothing wrong with being shy, right? As you kind of open up, it is so important to present yourself as you truly are, your authentic self. If you are very shy and you go out and you are telling people or acting as if you're the most outgoing person in the world, and then all of a sudden you get into a relationship with someone else who says, I love how outgoing that person is and they're telling me that they're always going to all these different events. I want that kind of person in my life as a romantic partner. And then they get to know you and in actuality, you don't like any of those things, right? You were basically just doing it uh, because, you know, it kind of felt good to do it and because maybe you felt a little socially awkward about saying that you're a little bit socially awkward, right? And just kind of being yourself is so difficult, maybe because you don't know who you are. Maybe you were bullied when you were younger. I was bullied in elementary school, like viciously bullied all the way through high school uh, for, uh, I mean, any number of reasons. I was an overweight kid. I had back problems. And so I had to have like a roller backpack. I got made fun of for that. I really didn't know how to dress, right? That was like a huge issue. I mean, you should see some photos of me from, from back then. It's like, what was this guy thinking, right? Uh, and when that happens, it definitely strongly impacts your belief that you are okay exactly how you are. But through tapping into faith in God's love for you, using that third key, right, exploring and prioritizing faith in your relationship with God, you're going to come to see that you are perfectly imperfect and you are lovable exactly how you are. You can be better as every person can in those and across those seven different dimensions of optimization, but it is something that you are okay as you are. Now, you're a shark though, can't stay still, always be moving forward. Choosing a target and moving towards it is something that we human beings were designed and built to do, right? Uh, however, right, once we know who we are, once we have a better sense, we'll never truly know exactly who we are, right? That's why we need God as well, uh, to be able to, you know, grant us that serenity. Uh, but it's something where once we can figure it out, and we're always going to be coming closer and closer approximations, to have the courage and the bravery and the integrity to present yourself and your thoughts exactly as they are. It means that some people aren't going to like you. 
but you guys know all these cliches, but there is truth behind the cliches, which is, I would rather someone not like me when I'm acting like who I truly am, uh, then I would have everybody like me, but be trying to please everybody all the time by kind of adapting and modifying who I am, what I say, what I believe, etc., to be able to minimize the likelihood of conflict. Now, obviously, you always have to be tactful, right? This isn't carte blanche to be able to say whatever you want and do whatever you want. That's not it. But essentially, it's to be able to stand on your own two feet. Uh, and as I'll explain in other videos, this is my uh, conceptualization of the difference between a nice guy and a good man. Huge difference. Maybe they both hold the door open for a woman. But why they do it is the differentiating factor, okay? So the nice guy holds it because he says, ah, like this is great, I'm holding the door because a gentleman holds the door. A chivalrous man holds the door, and that's me. I'm, I'm doing what society expects to be able to give me this label. Okay? And that's unattractive. Being that kind of a nice guy is unattractive. What is attractive is the guy who has the same behavior, but the reason is because he's a kind man. And the kind man opens the door and holds it for the woman because he has made the conscious decision that this is what he is choosing. He has decided that he is the kind of man, he has chosen this for himself, who holds doors open for women. Doesn't matter what everybody else wants him to do or not wants him to do. I am that person, I have chosen that. That is me, right? This is the I all of a sudden, okay? That is a huge difference. And a kind man is significantly more romantically attractive than is a nice guy. And we'll go deeper into that in other videos on this channel as well, so be sure to check those out. All right, everyone, thank you so much for joining me for this episode. As a reminder, please do like this video and share it with your friends. Please share it on social media. Please do comment below if you liked the video. It really helps us out a lot in terms of the YouTube algorithm. And if you're interested in one-on-one -on -one coaching with me, whether you're single or whether you are in a romantic relationship or married right now, please do go ahead and feel free to contact me via the website below and we can set up some coaching sessions. Thank you so much. God bless you all and have a wonderful day. Thank you so much for stopping by. If you enjoyed that episode and you'd like to see more original content, then please do click on one of the links right here. I hope to see you in the next one.